Well, good evening. We would like to welcome you to the Sunday evening service on this Lord's Day, on this Easter Sunday. And uh, we're going to be uh, back in the first uh, Peter chapter 1. It'll be our introductory sermon. Uh, and our title tonight is A Hope That Endures Suffering. In the middle of what we're going through in this time of trials, there's hope. And Peter's writing to the church offers hope to that church. And it's for us today that we might have the same hope. And so with that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to gather in your name. And Father God, we thank you, Lord, uh, for Easter and what it means to us and the resurrection. And that is our hope. Our hope is found in you, Lord. And we pray tonight that as we uh, bring the word, Lord, that you'd anoint it, that you'd uh, open the ears of the hearer and the eyes and uh, soften their heart to receive the word of gladness, Lord. And we pray that if tonight, if there's one who does not know you in the free pardon of sin, Lord, that you convict and draw. For those that are suffering and those that are hurting, Lord, we pray that this would give them hope, hope to endure. For that endurance will bring honor and glory to your name. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. My name is Kirk Kirkland, and this is the story, the hardest thing my family and I ever attempted. Uh, we were crazy enough to leave everything to move to Cincinnati to plant a church. My wife was nine months pregnant. We just had enough money to kind of pay the rent and survive and put food on the table. We only had just a few pieces of furniture. I remember we had a dining room table, a bed, and just somewhere to lay our, our child. We did not know one person who lived in the city. We didn't have a denomination. We didn't have a network behind us. We were very much on an island, but we were so compelled that we were um, following Jesus. And we advertised for our first service on uh, Easter of 2013, and 66 people from the city showed up on that very first day. I got counsel from another pastor who had made a similar journey, and he says, have you ever heard of North American Mission Board and support what you're doing of planting multiple churches? So we re-looked at what it meant to be to be a missionary. We realized that we didn't have to do it alone. And so we voted to plan another church and to join the Southern Baptist Convention. We said that, let's do this again. What we've seen God do, God can do it again in the suburbs. And so we committed to planning the second church. Now we're a part of a wider community and family, and we know that we're better together. Um, the training that we've received is the way that we plant churches. When you give to missions, we plant the next church, we go to the next town, we go to the next village, and when you give, lives are changed, plain and simple. One and two and three and four and Yeah. 
His majesty, His power and authority. Unshaken by schemes of men, unshaken by the schemes of men, never changing. Great I am. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. He is faithful through it all. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, and we are going to be reading as our scripture text tonight, uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispensation and in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him, though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As we look at this First Peter, I want to begin by talking a little bit about the setting of the writing of First Peter. 
It is authored by uh, Peter, as we talked about last week, as we looked at his background and, and where he came from, his calling and his failures, and yet his faith was a faith that endured to the end. And so uh, Peter writes to this church, uh, and he writes with authority. He writes as one who is an eyewitness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He was an eyewitness to the miracles of Jesus. He saw his death on the cross. Uh, and he also was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he is one that's writing with authority. He's also writing as an apostle. And he puts that right in the title here, in the first sentence, that he is an apostle. He was called out by Jesus to be an apostle, to be the leader, and to write. And so when he's writing this, he's writing with authority of what he has seen and what he has experienced. And he has experienced. He has experienced suffering. And he's also experienced triumph. And we've seen that last week. He's writing to an audience of, uh, of exiled Gentiles, to Greeks. Uh, they are in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. Uh, these are Christians, those that have come to faith in Christ, and, and they're being persecuted, and because of that, their persecution, they're being dispersed, and they're on the run. Uh, he calls them exiles. They're exiles because they're pilgrims. They're not at home. They're, they're like Abraham. Abraham was called to go to a country, and he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, and he abided in tents and temporary dwelling places because uh, uh, our heavenly home had not come yet. And that's what Paul, Peter is referring to here, is that these Gentiles, these Greeks, are in exile. Uh, they're roaming. They're living in temporary. And that's what I, he wants us to understand, that this present suffering that we're going through, this present persecution that they're enduring is temporal. It's only temporary. Uh, we're just passing through. We're not home yet. We haven't made it to the other side. And so we have hope. And so he's writing to a, uh, a, a, a community of believers who are beginning to be under the severe persecution of the Romans. Uh, the Romans saw the Christians as being enemies to Rome. Uh, as we look at the crucifixion story this past weekend, uh, we've seen that Jesus' crime, the purpose for which he was crucified by the Romans, was because he was challenging the authority and the rule of Caesar. In fact, as we've seen the stage there at Pilate, uh, uh, he's saying, uh, you know, this Jesus, uh, who is called King of the Jews, uh, uh, he's, he, I see no crime that he's committed, uh, and I would release him to you, but they say crucify him because we have no king but Caesar. And so they, uh, uh, and that's why Pontius Pilate, he put on the inscription above the cross uh, what he was accused of, and he was accused of being the King of the Jews. And because of that, uh, uh, now the followers of Jesus were called Christians. That's what they were called. And because of that, uh, uh, their allegiance was given to Jesus uh, instead of Caesar. In fact, Paul in his writing says, Jesus Christ is Lord. And that was their mantra instead of Caesar is Lord. And because of that, we see this animosity begin to build. And then Nero, in uh, July of uh, 64 AD, there was a burning of Rome. Uh, and many believe that Nero started it. But he blames the Christians as a diversion. When he finds out that it's politically uh, uh, damaging to himself, he begins to uh, shift blame over to the Christians, and he begins a war with the saints. He begins to, to persecute them. Uh, we have from history uh, cases where he would take these Christians and tar them, encase them in wax, and actually burn them at a stake uh, to light up his garden parties. Uh, they were crucified. Uh, they were killed to sport in public arenas by the gladiators and by wild beasts. And we also have the testimony that both Paul and Peter were both martyred in Rome. And so we see this persecution. And, and Peter is concerned that this persecution, that this difficult time, these, these trials, these sufferings that they're enduring, he wants to give them a hope that endures beyond the suffering. To realize that the suffering and the persecution and the trial that they're enduring is just temporal. It's just temporary. It's not going to last forever. But they have a hope, uh, they have a living hope that lives beyond the moment. And that for them not to get discouraged and not to give up hope, but to continue. And so he writes with the purpose of giving hope and encouragement to enduring the suffering, number one. And number two, to give practical advice on living God-honoring lives 
in the midst of our suffering. That's the purpose of 1 Peter. And so as we set that introductory, as we go to begin to study the book of Peter now, we'll look back and we'll see that these are the two over, over guiding themes that he wants us to get. And so tonight our message is a hope that endures in suffering. And we're going to look at six aspects or six reasons why we have hope in the middle of our difficulties. Number one, we have been chosen. We have hope because we have been chosen. And we're going to see that in verse number three, or verse number one and two. We have hope because we have a living hope, a living hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have a permanent, we have hope because we have a permanent inheritance. We're going to see that. We have hope because we have divine protection in our faith. We have hope because we have a tested faith, a genuine faith. When we have hope because we have an unseen Savior. And we're going to look at each one of those individually. So if you look at your Bibles in verses 1 and 2, we're going to see that we have hope because we have been chosen. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles, he's saying that we have been chosen. That's what that word means in verse number 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's important that we understand that we have hope because we've been chosen. That our salvation is not of our own doing, but we have been chosen by God even from the foundation of the world. Paul in his writings in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 6 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. God, from the very foundation of the world, before He said, let there be light, He had predetermined that we would be His from the very foundation of the world. That's hard for us to gasp. It's hard for us to understand, but we have the assurance uh, of hope because He chose us. I also like what's written in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30. Uh, one of my favorite verses, it says, For those whom He free foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be first more born among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called... And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What great truths we have here. We also understand in verse number 2, it says, In the sanctification of the Spirit, we need to understand and realize that it is a work of the Holy Spirit to set us apart. Uh, we did not come looking for God. God came looking for us. Uh, we were running in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says in Ephesians, we were dead. We had no way to respond to God, but that God, He sent His Holy Spirit to quicken us, to make us alive to the truths of the gospel, to receive the truth. Uh, he convicts us, uh, and then we respond to that, and that is the faith that saves us. Also, He says in here, He says, for the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's the proof of our election. That's the proof that we've been chosen, that we obey Him. If we obey Him, it proves that we have been chosen by Him and set apart. And lastly, and as we look at the Lord's Supper, we see it was secured by the blood of Christ. Jesus at the Last Supper, when He is uh, celebrating the Passover, He takes the emblems of, of uh, uh, the Passover, the bread, and He said, this is my body that's broken for you. And then He takes the cup of His blood that is shed for the remission of sins. And he, takes, he says, take, drink ye all of it. And this is the blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, the new promise. Uh, and that is the assurance that we have that we have been chosen and God is going to keep His promise to the end. So that gives us hope to endure. Let's move on to the second one. We have a living hope. Verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, that's great news. We have hope because we have a living hope. We have a resurrection from the dead. Uh, number one, it's because of God's great mercy toward us. Uh, uh, we didn't merit it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. Uh, uh, God uh, 
why did he choose us? We have no idea. He chose us out of his great mercy toward us. Uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but the Bible says, but God, who is rich in mercy, pursues us and reaches after us. Uh, he says we are born again. Uh, we have hope because we're born again. Uh, it reminds us in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came at night to meet with Jesus. And uh, he says to him, uh, you know, Rabbi, we know that you're from God because nobody else can do the things that you can do. Uh, we've seen these miracles that testify that you truly are from God. And uh, Jesus says to him, uh, unless you've been born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus is uh, unsure of this. He was counting on his own works of righteousness. He was counting on his uh, 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 keeping of the law to keep him righteous before God. And Jesus turns this apple cart upside down by saying to him, you must be born again. Uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And unless you've been born by the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He's confused by that. And so Jesus gives him this Old Testament story for him to look back to to understand. So I want to take you back to Numbers to look at the story that gives him. He tells uh, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what he's saying to Nicodemus is this. Nicodemus, in that story, we see in Israel, they were in the, uh, the desert, they were in the wilderness, and they were murmuring and they were complaining about God. And so God caused these serpents to be coming to the camp. And these serpents, uh, uh, they were vipers and they had poisonous, uh, uh, and they would bite the people. And because of the poison and because of uh, the bite, they would die. And... Uh, and this got their attention. They're suffering here. And, uh, but God, through Moses, gives a remedy. And he tells Moses to take a pole and create a serpent uh, in, in the image of the serpents that they were, were seeing and put it on a pole and set that pole in the middle of the camp and that whoever would be bitten, if they would just go in faith and go to the center of the camp and look to that, uh, uh, that serpent on the pole, that they would be healed. Now, that doesn't make sense from a scientific standpoint. Uh, it only makes sense from a faith standpoint. And from the fact that God's Word said that the remedy for the, the, the illness caused uh, by the viper's bite that would lead to death was to go and to look. And when they looked upon that in faith and believed they would be healed. And so truly, there was some of those in the camp who got bit and uh, they didn't go. They said, that's hogwash. I'm not going to believe in that and I'm going to do my own thing. And there was some who thought, well, if I don't go, I'm going to die. So they go in faith and they're healed. And they began to give the testimony to others in the camp when they got bit to go and look and live. And that's what Jesus is saying as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so I will be lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross for all the world to see. He became sin for us who knew no sin. And the judgment of God was poured out upon Jesus for your sin and my sin. And now when we look to him as the author and finisher of our faith, as the propitiation of our sins, uh, God receives us in faith and we're redeemed and we are healed and we are made whole and we are born again unto the kingdom of God as children of righteousness. We used to be children of wrath. The, the children of the serpent, the children of, the, uh, uh, of wrath, uh, the sons of disobedience. But now for those who've looked unto Christ and His work on the cross and believed into salvation, now they are the children of God. And they are the objects of God's mercy and God's love and God's affection. And He gives proof positive by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do we know that the work on the cross was enough because God raised him from the dead. The hope of the resurrection is found in the fact that after three days, God raised him from the dead. And why he did that was to prove to us that what Jesus did on the cross, that he extinguished the full wrath of God on the cross and that God was satisfied with the work on the cross. There's nothing more to be done. There's no more that we could add to it, uh, that it's sufficient. Uh, and now that Jesus is raised from the dead, He's the first one. And because of that, we have that hope of a bodily resurrection as Jesus was raised from the dead. And we know today, according to the Scripture, that He sits at the right hand of the Father. He sits at the right hand, the right of privilege, 
the right of acquittal. And he sits there right now making intercessory for you and for I. That gives us a living hope. Because he lives, we have hope. Hope to endure the suffering that we go through. Let's move on to the next one. The third one, we have hope because we have a permanent inheritance. Verse number four. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Isn't that an interesting thing? That we have an inheritance. God, He not just gives us eternal life, but He gives us an inheritance. And I want you to understand our inheritance is Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. Uh, uh, the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, that at the, at the moment we believe, we are given a down payment of our faith. And that is found in the giving of the Holy Spirit. When we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in us as a guaranteed of the inheritance yet to come. It's the same word that's used as a down payment. It's also the same idea as an engagement ring. And uh, uh, every Jewish boy, when he would be in spouse to, uh, to his wife-to-be, as they stood in the synagogue, he would say to them, I go to prepare a place for you. And he would leave, and he would go, and for at least nine months, and most of the time it was a year, he would go away to uh, secure a place for his bride. And he would come back at a time unannounced and she was to make herself ready for him and to be faithful and wait upon him and might endure a a long period of time without contact with him. But when he came, she was to be made ready that where he is, she may be also. That's the promise that Jesus made to his disciples at the Last Supper. He said to them, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would told you so. But if I go away, he's going to come again, that where he is, we might be also. We have a permanent inheritance, and our inheritance is found in Christ. It's, number one, imperishable. It can't spoil. It doesn't have an expiration date. It's not going to go bad. It's undefiled. It cannot be corrupted. It's unfading. The picture in 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 the Greek here of the unfading is a picture of a flower. I know... uh, uh, we will buy our wives flowers, maybe roses or flowers for a special occasion. And uh, as soon as we bring them home and they put them in that, that vase, uh, in a few days the, the petals begin to wither and to begin to fall off and begin to fade away. Uh, our inheritance will not fade away. It will never lose its beauty. It will never lose its glory. And it's kept for us in heaven. It cannot be lost. What great hope we have because of that. And Paul, Peter wants to encourage us, but because we have a permanent inheritance, we have hope. Let's move on to the next one. We have hope because we have divine protection. Verse number five, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this one because we spent all last week talking about it. Uh, Peter's life is a testimony to this, uh, that he was kept uh, uh, by God because he had a faith that was legitimate. He had a faith that could not fail. We are kept by God's power. God is the one who saves us, and he's the one who keeps us. I just want to read one scripture to you in Jude uh, verse 24. It's one of my favorite. Now to him, speaking of Christ, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Peter wants to remind us that we have a faith that cannot fail. Uh, I want to move on quickly to the next one, which is we have hope. Because we have a tested faith. And that's found in verses 6 and verse 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want you to remind yourself that, number one, we have hope because our trials are temporary. 
This is not going to last forever. What we're going through right now uh, is a trial. There's no question about it. Uh, what we have seen over the last month and may continue for weeks ahead, maybe months ahead, is a trial. It's difficult. It's not enjoyable. We don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy being separated from my family members. I don't enjoy being separated from uh, the church. I don't enjoy being separated from most of the kids. Uh, I don't enjoy not being around other people. And so this is a trial. And the important thing we need to understand that this trial, as any trials are, they're temporary. Number two, we must understand that trials are necessary. They have purpose. God doesn't allow these trials and difficulties and persecutions and sufferings to happen for just no reason. He has a divine purpose in mind with everything that we suffer, everything we endure. I love in Psalms where it says that He takes and He bottles our tears. Our disappointments and our struggles and our tears. And there certainly have been tears uh, cried in the midst of this uh, difficulty that we're going through. Uh, there's family members that are suffering and hurting. Uh, people have died from this and, and uh, we see that. God doesn't do it lightly. It's done with purpose. And so much so that he takes the tears in our sorrows and he bottles them. They're that precious. We also understand that the purpose of the trials is to sanctify us, uh, to make us more like Christ. They, they are to prove the genuineness of our faith. Uh, they are to test our faith. It is to exercise our faith. Uh, we want to build muscle in the gym, so we take, we take uh, weights that are uh, heavy, and we strain against them, and the purpose of it is it breaks down the muscle tissue, uh, and then uh, the muscle will rebuild itself and become stronger, and it becomes bigger, and it'll be more viable. Same way with our faith. Uh, our faith has to be exercised. Uh, a faith that doesn't, isn't tested isn't real faith. Uh, it has to be uh, uh, put under pressure. Uh, and the example that's given in here is the picture of, uh, of gold. Gold was the most precious uh, metal found found uh, in the ancient world. And even today, uh, we give uh, our brides-to-be uh, golden rings with diamonds because they're precious uh, uh, and they uh, uh, have a purity to them. They have a beauty to them. Uh, but when we get that gold out of the ground, it doesn't look that way. It doesn't look pretty. It is mixed with other minerals uh, uh, and other uh, defects, uh, uh, lead and, and iron and other things that are mixed with it. And so what happens is in order to, to remove those impurities, they call it the dross, uh, uh, the workman will put it into a fire. And they'll heat this fire up, and, and because of the, of the physical properties of the metals, they, they melt at different melting points. Uh, and so what happens is as they increase the heat, uh, uh, the lead will, uh, will come off first. Uh, it has a low uh, melting point, and it will, it will be burnt off. And they can take and remove that dross from that. And they continue to heat it up until all the dross is gone. And what is found left is pure gold. And that pure gold will now gleam in the glory of the light. And that's the picture that Peter wants us to understand. That when we go through these trials and we go through these difficulties, there are various trials, there's many trials, uh, uh, there are different leveling of trials, but we're all going to endure them, we're all going to go through them, and they have purpose to remove the things in our lives that don't matter. The things in our lives that don't bring glory to God. They remove the love of the flesh, and let's be honest, we all struggle with the flesh, we all live in this body, we all desire the things of this world. Isn't it interesting that we are, our idols have been removed, uh, the things that we pursue over the things of God are now being removed by this trial. The things that we worship before God have been being removed one at a time. Why? So that when we're done, we will be found pure. More like Christ, that our motives will be more uh, genuine, that we'll be more pointed to Christ. To the result, at the enduring the trial, when the trial is over, and we come out the other side, and we bear in our bodies the image of Christ and His glory, and we become more like Him. I can tell you when I was 16 years old, even though I was saved, I didn't always act like a Christian. I didn't talk like a Christian. I certainly didn't listen to music that glorify God. But now, uh, the testimony that I have, I hope, now being 50, that I'm more like Christ today than I've ever been. I know when I was uh, a young man, I would pray once a day 
uh, maybe twice at the end of the day. Uh, and now I pray almost continually. It seems like through the course of the day as I walk and as I face the trials of the day, I'm seeking God's will and God's direction and God's pattern for my life. And I'm reminded that Jesus spoke and, and walked with God. He was in total communion with God continually. And that's the commandment that Paul gave to the church is to pray without ceasing. As we become through these trials, we become more like Christ to the result in the praise and the glory and the honoring at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When he comes, we'll be found like him. And that is a reason for hope over the trial. And lastly, we have hope because we have an unseen Savior. Verse number 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, now see him. You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. We have a love for a Savior we have not seen. I am reminded in this uh, Easter season of the testimony of Thomas. It's found in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. He's talking about after the resurrection and Jesus showed up to the disciples. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your hand here. See my hands, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. He did not even wait. We have no testimony in the scripture that he reached out and touched him. But he just said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. Those of us who have been called out. We love him though we haven't seen Him. We have chosen Him for as much as we know how in response of His love for us and Him choosing us. And this produces abiding joy. Joy that overcomes our circumstances and our afflictions. They're momentary because we have the assurance of the Spirit that lives inside of us that we are the children of God and we love Him. And now as we come to our last point and conclusion for today, we want to look at verse number 9 saying, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's where we come to the conclusion. Peter wants us to have faith because our faith ends in hope for the salvation of our souls to the eternity. And I, I want to look at our salvation in terms of three aspects, and that is the justification, sanctification, and glorification. The term salvation uh, means, number one, that we have been justified before God. Uh, we were saved. It's a, a salvation in the past. We were saved by Christ uh, on the cross. Uh, we are saved from the penalty of sin. We're no longer under the judgment of God. We are not, no longer under the condemnation of God. We are standing before God in the holiness of Christ just as we've never sinned. Uh, that is our profession, that we have professed that He is our Lord and we are His children. Children, and we are without sin. We are hid in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that is our justification. Now we live in the flesh. Once we come to faith in Him, the next aspect of our salvation is sanctification. We are being saved. It's the process that we're going through right now. We are being saved by the power of sin. Even though we get saved and we are justified, uh, our practice doesn't always match our profession. And so the process of sanctification is the purifying of our flesh that we might become more like Christ. Uh, and it is a work in progress. And we will, we will fight that flesh until the day that Jesus comes. And that leads us to our last aspect, and that is our glorification. 
And that's the last part, and that's the part looking forward, we will be saved. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And glorification is looking to the day when this body that's fleshly will be replaced by a heavenly body, one that will do perfectly the will of God. Uh, the thing that I'm looking forward to heaven most of all is the absence of the power of sin in my life. That I will have complete victory over it. I will no longer be subject to it. I will no longer be disobedient to God, but I will be in perfect obedience to Him because I will have a body that desires to please Him as my soul pleases Him. And I will be saved from the presence of sin. And that brings us to the last hope. When will this all come about? At the revelation of Jesus Christ, when He comes again in His glory. Peter wants us to have hope because our redemption draws nigh. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You today for this message of hope. Our prayer is today, if there's one who doesn't have that hope, that they would find it in You. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You have secured our eternal home through Your death and your burial, and your resurrection. We thank you for that living hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in his name we give thanks, and amen.